everybody, and welcome to my presentation, Go Profiling from Bottom Up. My partner is Russian, and she always teases me that the only Russian word that I know is Chinese. So I want to use this opportunity as an attempt to prove her wrong. And I want to do this by saying I am Ochin Priyatna to virtually meet all of you, and also Bolshoi Spasiba to the organizers of this conference for giving me a chance to present here and for organizing this conference. So my name is Felix Geisendorfer, and I work for a company called Datadog, where I work on a continuous profiling for Go product. And one of the cool things about this job is that I get to do a lot of research on Go profiling and share it with the Go community. So you can find a lot of this on github.com slash datadoc slash go profiler nodes. And in fact, a lot of this presentation was based on the information you can also find there. I will continue maintaining this repository and adding more stuff over time. So it's worth coming back to it. And feedback uh, is very welcome. If you find any issues or anything is unclear, please let me know. Um, as for my past, I was at Apple for quite a while um, doing Go and lots of PostgreSQL. Um, before that, more Go. And before that, I was co-founder of a startup myself. Uh, I've also done a lot of open source over the years. And my github.com slash felixge has a readme that uh, has a good summary of the projects I've either contributed to or started myself. So this presentation is basically how the profiling sausage is made. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find the right image. This contains neither profiling nor sausage, but I hope you get the idea. Um, the premise of this talk is that Go ships with great profiling tools, uh, but it's easy to get confused and misunderstand the data. I believe this is partially because there is a lot of data, but very little information on what any of it actually means. So we have a lot of presentations and blog posts and stuff about Go tool pprof and the various fields, maybe a little bit on about the profiles itself. Uh, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. What we don't talk about a lot is sort of what's underneath and all the technical details that go into making the profiles work, um, how accurate they are, what overheads they have, et cetera. And I believe this information is pretty essential because how can you accurately look at a flame graph or some visualization and determine how it applies to your program if you're not 100% sure how this data actually works? Also, how can you be sure that turning on profiling and production is a good idea and it's safe to do if you don't understand the impacts on your program. So that's something we're going to try to, to cover in this presentation a bit. We'll do this in a bit of an unusual format. So instead of going top down like most presentations, where we might start with something like the visualizations, working our way down, uh, we'll do the opposite. And we'll start at the bottom with low level stuff and work our way up. Um, because we don't have infinite amount of time, there is a trade-off here, which means we'll cover a lot of low-level stuff, but we might not make it all the way to the top. So I can already tell you that today we're not going to talk about visualizations, for example. Um, but hopefully, this approach will be interesting regardless. Uh, you will need a little patience, though, because it, we will not directly start with profiling, and we'll take a little bit to get into the profiling stuff itself. But you'll see it all makes sense in the end. So let's start with the low-level topic. Let's start with assembly. Um, we don't need a lot of assembly knowledge for this presentation, but we do need to know that these things over here are called program counters, and these things to the right are called instructions. And CPUs generally execute assembly by going from program counter to program counter and executing the corresponding instruction. Of course, CPUs are much more complicated than that, but this is good enough for today. The next thing I want to say is that obviously we know that computers like assembly. <clears throat> it's easy for them to execute. Um, humans, on the other hand, we don't like assembly. For us, myself included, assembly is pretty difficult to read and write. So we like source code. And because humans think that source code is relatively easy to read and write, uh, computers, on the other hand, don't like source code. They think that humans are kind of weird, and they probably have a point. But anyway, we need some help. And uh, this is where Go can come in. Go can basically help us to translate from the source code that we humans like to the assemblies that the computers prefer. Uh, the way we do that in Go is we take our source code, we invoke Go build, and then the name of our source file, and Go produces assembly for us. Nice and simple. Now, there's only one problem. Humans are not very good at writing source code. 
So the source code we write constantly will run into issues and the gopher will have to tell us what the problem is because in fact, this is not fine. We make bugs all the time. The way gophers tell us uh, about our mistakes are stack traces. Here you can see a simple stack trace from a go panic. And hopefully you as a <coughs> developer will be able to analyze this and find the problem. In order to do this, uh, to show you a stack trace, Go needs a way to basically go from the assembly back to the source code and give you identifiers in the source code when something like perhaps a panic happens. And the way that this works is by having Go build actually do a few things. Go build doesn't just produce assembly, it also produces other stuff. All this stuff gets wrapped into what's called an executable Go binary. And you've got the assembly there. You also have something called Go PC line tab, something called dwarf, and other sections that we're not going to cover today. Maybe worth noting is that depending on your operating system, whether you're on Linux, Apple, or Windows, the container format will be ELF, MACO, or PE. And of course, depending on your CPU architecture and instruction set, uh, your assembly might be Intel-based or ARM-based and will look a little different. Now let's talk about GoPC line tap. GoPC line tap is basically a function lookup table. And you can see part of the implementation here. We don't have to go into all these details, but what we need to understand is that given a program counter, we can use this find bucket data structure here to quickly find the metadata for a function. This metadata looks like this. And one of the fields it has is the name of the function, which is useful when you want to create a stack trace. <clears throat> a more simplified view of this idea is shown here, where you basically have your Go PC line tab. Uh, as a main idea, it's basically just a table that translates from program counters to function names. And the way it does that is the table contains entry program counters for the beginnings of each function and directly maps them to the function names. So we can take any of these program counters, figure out the closest function entry point, and then look up the file name. And we can do that pretty quickly. Now it's time to actually run our Go binary. And when we do this and execute the assembly, Go will generally spawn one or more Go routines. And each Go routine has a stack, which is a little region of memory to keep local variables and other stuff. And there's a heap that can be used to put data that is either going to outlive the lifetime of our Go routine or needs to be shared with other Go routines. We're not going to talk about the heap a lot today, but we will talk about the stack quite a bit. So let's do that. Here is a diagram that shows a Go routine stack. And we'll start at the bottom here. The first thing to know is that Go routine stacks start pretty small. They start at two kilobytes. And at the end of the stack, there's always some free space. And when your program fills up that space and you run out of stack space, Go will automatically allocate a bigger stack for you and copy the old data to the new stack. Uh, this dynamic growth of the stack is one of the key reasons why Go routines are more scalable than operating system threads. And it's also very convenient. Um, in other programming languages, uh, outgrowing your stack would lead to a stack overflow error. All right. The next thing I want to focus your attention on is the red stuff, everything red colored in this picture. Um, we'll start over here. This right here is RIP, the instruction pointer CPU register, which points to a program counter of the currently executing uh, assembly instruction. And this program counter can be used to look up the entry point of the function that it belongs to. So basically, this register alone is enough to figure out what the current function is. So what about the other functions? What about the function calling the current function? Well, there's various techniques for uh, doing what's called walking the stack to find those other functions. But one pretty simple way that we'll also talk about more later is called frame pointer unwinding. And the way that works is you take another CPU register called RBP, the base pointer register, and that's your starting point to, to go into the stack. And one of the things to know is that above the frame pointer in the stack, there always sits a return address in Go. And this return address, again, is a pointer into the assembly that can be used to look up another function name. In this case, it would be the caller of the current function. 
And brain pointer unwinding then continues by basically following the value stored at the frame pointer, which points to the next frame pointer, which leads us to the next return address, which again lets us identify another caller on the stack. And oops, we basically keep doing this um, until we reach the last frame pointer, which usually holds the value zero. And that also has the last function on the stack. Now we've reached the bottom of the stack. This process, as I already mentioned, can be called stack walking or also unwinding. And so unwinding is the process of taking the stack, which is just some memory, and finding the program counters on the stack that represent our call chain, uh, so, i.e. the current function that's being executed as well as all of its callers. Now, these program counters that result from this are generally not very useful to us. So often we need another step that is called symbolization. Symbolization is the idea of taking program counters and converting them into human readable symbols, such as function names, file names, or line numbers. And that's what we typically refer to as a stack trace. So now let's talk about unwinding in a little bit more detail. The frame point unwinding we already discussed is not actually what Go uses. The Go runtime uses Go PC line tap, um, and that includes all the profilers that are built into Go. Frame pointers themselves were introduced to Go mostly to support external tools such as Linux Perf, which prefer them for unwinding. However, Linux Perf and especially debuggers also prefer and know another format called Dwarf that Go also supports and we'll talk about as well. Let's start with Go PC line tap. Go PC line tap basically supports unwinding and symbolization. It is ON with regards to the number of stack frames in terms of time complexity. If you want to look at the Go internals, the gen traceback function in the runtime has all the magic. That function is pretty complex. It took me a long time to understand this code. Um, and it's also pretty slow, um, meaning it takes one to two microseconds to unwind a stack of depth 16. You might not think of that as very slow, but as we'll see later, this can become a bottleneck for use cases where we have to unwind a lot of stacks. There's very little documentation on this format. Um, and that's something I'm trying to change with my Go profiler nodes. Um, it is worth noting that Go PC line tab works entirely without frame pointers, so it can unwind without them. And the way it accomplishes that is through what I call virtual frame pointer tables that basically allow you to figure out where frame pointers would be if you had them. Uh, it's a little complicated and we'll not discuss it here, but uh, it works pretty well. Um, and also worth noting is that Go PC line tab can be a significant contributor to the binary size of Go programs. Um, public APIs, there are some APIs available to interact with the functionality provided by Go PC line tab. Unwinding can be done by runtime.callers. Symbolization can be done by runtime caller frames. Uh, if you want both combined and directly get a, a stack trace in text format, you can call runtime.stack or debug.stack. And then there is another package called debug slash gosim, which actually contains a completely separate implementation of Go PC line tab, which you can also use to look at the binary PC line tab data contained in uh, Go binary files and play around with that. Uh, it's worth exploring. Frame pointers we already talked about, same complexity as Go PC line tab. Only unwinding is supported. For symbolization, you still need some sort of lookup tables that frame pointers themselves don't provide. All 64 Go, uh, bit Go binaries have frame pointers enabled. 32-bit uh, binaries, as far as I know, do not. Frame pointers allow fast and simple unwinding. You can already tell from us doing the unwinding visually in the crafts that it's very simple and, and easy. Uh, I've written a little program that does it, and I found it to be about 50 times faster than Go PC line tap for finding the program counters on the stack. Now, such a naive implementation, however, has an issue. It won't handle inline functions. So if you want to get inline functions to show correctly, you will need some lookup tables from perhaps Go PC line tap, and that will make things a little bit slower. Um, frame pointers at about 2% overhead to regular program execution. So frame pointers basically have to be pushed onto the stack by every function that you call. It's the callee's responsibility to push these frame pointers, and that slows things down a little bit. Because of this, some compilers, like GCC, 
have options like f omit frame pointers that allow you to compile, compile your binaries in a way that no frame pointers will be pushed on the stack. In Go, there is no such option. And I think that's a very good thing. People who disable frame pointers are bad people who have no empathy towards other people who have to debug their stuff and profile it. So please don't be like this. Um, I think most people in the uh, performance and profiling community would, would recommend you to uh, not omit frame pointers. But luckily in Go, you don't even get a choice. So um, things are good by default. Um, also worth noting, I already mentioned that frame pointers are pushed by the colleague. This leads to a small race condition that if you use a tool like Linux Perf that relies on frame pointers for unwinding to do CPU profiling, you might sometimes get a stack trace that is missing the caller of the current function because that function, the callee, has not pushed that frame pointer onto the stack yet. Um, it's probably pretty rare to hit that, but it's worth knowing if you sometimes see something weird. Um, and last but not least, there is a proposal uh, called Runtime Use Frame Pointers for Callers that is trying to implement frame pointer support in the Go runtime for faster unwinding. And we'll discuss why this is an uh, important topic again a little bit later on. Last but not least, 12. Uh, 12 supports also unwinding and symbolization. Uh, the 12 format is very complex, but at least it's standardized and documented. Um, it is somewhat famously has been rejected for unwinding in the Linux kernel. Linus Thorwald has basically said that he doesn't want anything nearly as complex as 12 anywhere near a panicking kernel, where you want something really robust, simple, and reliable, and not something that only gets tested when the unhappy pass triggers. Um, so the Linux people did what most people in the systems uh, community seem to do. They implemented their own unwinding uh, tables and, and algorithms, and they call that org. So you now have org, 12, and elf. So the whole Tolkien uh, uh, fantasy world is, is there now. Um, anyway, as far as Go is concerned, Go always emits 12 version 4 symbols by default. So all Go binaries have both 12 and Go PC line type, actually. Um, because this is a bit redundant, Rob Pike has a proposal to disable 12 by default. Uh, this would enable faster builds and smaller binaries. And in theory, you can still use the built-in Go profilers and, and tools, but it's a bit of a devil's bargain because most debuggers, as well as Linux Perf, actually rely on Dwarf for various things, sometimes unwinding, but also symbolization. And so if you take Dwarf away, it's a big problem to uh, debug stuff. Um, there's also some people who passionately hate Dwarf in general. And so there is a uh, interesting debate going on whether the distinction between Dwarf and the devil even makes sense to begin with. So get your popcorn and follow this thread. I'm sure there's going to be some interesting uh, debates happening there. Um, that was probably more than you've ever wanted to know about stack traces. But uh, in case you still want to know more, I've written more, and you can find CRL. I also want to thank Michael Pratt for, from the Go team for helping me with Go PC line type related questions and review. Now, now that we have stack traces, we get closer to profiling. Uh, what if we had a lot of stack traces and we wanted to store them? How could we do that? Well, the answer is the pprof format. The pprof format is a protocol buffer format uh, that is always stored using gzip compression. You can see a visualization of the schema to the right, but we don't need to get into that level of detail. What we mostly care about today is that pprof files contain program counters and symbols i.e. function names, file names, line numbers, that sort of stuff. And Go profilers generally output data using this pprof format. An even simpler way to think about pprof, the, the format, is that it's just a fancy way of encoding a frequency table of stack traces. So you have a stack trace like this one, and you just count how many times you've seen this stack trace. And that's it. That's pretty much a pprof file. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Brandon Craig at this point. Uh, he's the inventor of Flamecrafts and many other profiling uh, techniques and, and information. And uh, I really admire the uh, text format that he chose for his uh, Flamecraft visualization tool, because it's literally just this frequency table as a straightforward text file. And there are some limitations to simple formats like this. For example, you don't have file names and line numbers, but it's just so refreshing to, to see something uh, so, so simple and, and elegant compared to all the complexity that we have 
uh, in, in our industry these days. Um, so yeah, I really like that. In fact, I like it so much that I wrote a little tool uh, that can convert uh, PPROF files to text format, um, and you can download it and play with it if you want. If you want something built into Go, you can use Go tool PPROF with the raw flag, which will give you an output like this, which also has a lot of details of, or more details of what is in the PPROF file. And if that's not enough for you, you can use Proto C uh, to give you really the raw contents of a PPROF file that looks like this. Um, the only way to get even more raw information would be to look to, to fire up a hex editor and look at the raw data directly. All right. Uh, if you want to know more about PPROF, I have written a little bit more. You can check it out. And now we're finally getting closer to the main attraction of this presentation. Humans write slow code, and we need tools to do stuff about it. And those tools are generally called tracing and profiling. And we'll try to quickly introduce the ideas and then look at which profilers go work which way and, and uh, some more details on them. Let's start with tracing. The main idea in tracing is to capture all the events. Let's say the blue gopher over right here wants to observe the pink gopher on the right. The blue gopher can do this by saying, hey, can you write down everything you're doing? To which the pink gopher replies, ah, oh, that will be slow, uh, that will slow me down a lot, but sure. And so then the pink gopher can get to work and start creating an event log where for every timestamp it records when it's starting something, when it's stopping something, etc. And you end up with a lot of data. But that data can be very useful. For example, if you want to debug a latency issue that only happens very rarely, you now really have all the data to look at. An example of a tool in Go that works like that is the Go Tracer. The Go Tracer captures all kinds of interesting events that are happening in the Go runtime. And there are various ways to enable it. But one of them is Go Test has a flag called dash trace. Um, unfortunately, the Go Tracer is only available in a sort of fire hose mode where you get all the events, including every Go routine being scheduled. And that creates a lot of overhead. In fact, 40 to 50% overhead are expected when enabling the Go Trace program, uh, Go Trace mode on a Go program. So you do not want to enable this in production. However, it would be nice to be able to enable this in production. So people are looking at where all this overhead is coming from. And in fact, it turns out a significant amount of this overhead is due to capturing stack traces. And that is essentially why the proposal in Go was made to support frame pointer unwinding as an alternative to Go PC line tap. So tools like the Go tracer that needs to take a lot of stack traces can achieve lower overhead. Um, also worth saying is that Go tool trace can be used to analyze the tracing data, including converting tracing data to PPROF files that we talked about previously. All right, finally, it's time to talk about profiling. Profiling is observing stuff by sampling it. And this time, it's the pink gopher's turn. The pink gopher wants to observe the blue gopher. And the way it's doing that is by sampling it. So it's like saying, hey, what are you doing? And then the blue gopher is like, oh, x. Hey, what are you doing? Oh, y. Hey, what you're doing? X. And the end result is recorded by the pink gopher, which keeps a frequency table of what the blue gopher is up to. Every time a new event is observed, a new row gets added. Every time an existing one is observed again, you just increment the counter. Um, the blue gopher notes that this is slowing me down a little, but the low frequency makes it OK. So if the pink gopher does it on a low frequency, then it won't disrupt the blue gopher too much. Also worth noting is if the pink gopher keeps that frequency very stable and does it, let's say, exactly every one second, then this frequency table here eventually becomes a statistically representative view of what the blue gopher was doing over time. And in Go, there's actually two profilers that work like this. One of them is a CPU profiler. The other one is a Go routine profiler. So let's talk about this. The CPU profiler uses set iTimer, which is a system call, uh, which allows it to interrupt and stop Go programs 100 times per second. This interrupt happens via SIGPROF signals that are delivered to random threads. They're not so random. We'll get back to that. Um, then the interrupted thread takes a stack trace of the current Go routine that is running and adds it to the profile. Uh, you can see this down here. 
Um, so you basically have the stack trace and you record how many times you see it. We'll get to this in a second. Um, there's some minor issues. Uh, so there's signal delivery bias, which we already mentioned. There's skid, and there's some overhead. Um, we won't discuss this in full detail here, and I plan to do some more research on it. But the overhead is generally low, and these biases and issues here are generally small enough that uh, it is safe to enable CPU profiling in production, and uh, the results are usually very useful. Uh, back to the sample counts and the duration here. One thing to note is that these two are entirely redundant. In fact, the uh, CPU nanoseconds duration is derived from the sample count by basically multiplying this value by 10 milliseconds. 10 milliseconds, uh, you can create that value by dividing one second through 100, which is the frequency at which the sampling is happening. Um, there's some weird stuff where sometimes I found workloads where the SIGPROF signals from the CPU profiler can actually make a program go faster rather than slower. You can kind of see it in the data down here. Um, I still have to debug this. This could be a frequency scaling issue or a scheduler issue. Or a colleague of mine mentioned that it could be related to syscalls that use timeouts. Um, but it's something I plan to follow up on. Uh, and yeah, more of that research is coming soon on the Go profiler nodes. Now the Go routine profiler. The Go routine profiler returns a list of all Go routines and their current stack trace. Now, since it's all Go routines, you might ask, is that really a sampling profiler? To which my answer would be yes, because yes, you get all the Go routines, but you do not see how they change over time. You have to keep sampling, like what do they look like now? And what about now? And what about now? To get a picture over time. And that's still a sampling process, just like the CPU profiler. Um, this, what's really important to point out here is that the Go routine profiler stops the world while profiling. And it is a ON complexity with respect to the number of Go routines uh, that, that determines the time of the pause. And it can, in my testing, take 2 to 10 microseconds of time um, where per Go routine where things are paused. And if you have a very low number of Go routines, that's nothing to worry about. But if you have 10 to 100,000 Go routines, these pauses might become tens or hundreds of milliseconds, or in some extreme cases, even multiple seconds. So if you enable this profiler, you certainly want to be uh, considering that. And you also want to consider how frequent you want to take that profile. But perhaps if you do it only once per minute, it's good enough to not worry about it. Um, I have a project called FGProf, which uses this Go routine profiler for walk log profiling, but it has those scalability issues. So it's currently not recommended for production. And the PProf profile basically looks like this. You get stack traces. And then you get how often a Go routine has been seen in exactly the stack trace. Um, another pet peeve of mine is that the Go routine profiling uh, in Go has a lot of different APIs to access it. And each API is a little different in terms of what data it gives you and what the output format looks like, et cetera. And none of it is really perfect. So maybe this is something I can help contribute uh, improvements to upstream in the future. Um, and I've also written a lot more about Go routine profiling, which you can find here. Now we're ready to talk about tracing and profiling. That is um, combining the two ideas that we've presented so far together into a, a new approach. And I would call this uh, essentially this hybrid approach summarizing a subset of events. So here we get the clue gopher that says, hey, can you capture, capture every 10 thing you do and summarize it? And then the pink gopher is like, sure, I can do this pretty fast. And so now the pink gopher still has to look at a lot of events that are happening, but only has to pick one out of 10 of these events and then increment it in the frequency table if it's seen it before or add a new row if it hasn't. But it doesn't keep, have to keep a timestamp and individual record for every event, which makes it much simpler and much less overhead. And in fact, quite a few profilers in Go work like that. The heap profiler, the mutex profiler, the block profiler, and the thread create profiler work like that. So let's talk about some. For the heap profiler, I would like to introduce this via some pseudocode, which you can see here. So the heap profiler works by instrumenting the malloc function, which is used to allocate memory internally in Go. So basically, if you want to allocate memory for some object, you have some allocation magic, which we will not discuss. And then the heap profiler 
basically makes a decision if it should randomly sample the current allocation based on its size. Um, this is done using a Poisson sampling uh, algorithm, which we'll not discuss. But if a allocation gets chosen for sampling, we basically take a stack trace of the, uh, of the current caller that is triggering this allocation. We look up this stack trace in the profile and increment the number of allocations, as well as the cumulative amount of bytes of allocations using the size of the object. And then we track this profiled object on the heap together with the stack trace that allocated it. So we put that information somewhere else so we can get it later. And then the malloc just returns. So here you have explicit instrumentation inside of the Go runtime for certain events that get sampled, which is a hybrid between tracing and profiling. On the other side of things, when the garbage collector decides to free an object by sweeping it, um, there is a little piece of code that checks, hey, is this a profiled object, it's like one of the ones that we started tracking above here? If yes, get the stack trace for that object that was used to do the initial allocation. Look up the stack trace in the profile again, and this time increments the number of free operations that have happened at the stack trace and increments the cumulative number of bytes that have been freed based on the size of this object. Um, we'll talk about why we need this and how this is given to us in a second. So this is heap profiler. The uh, sampling rate can be controlled with mem profile rate. Uh, the default aims to do one sample per 512 kilobyte of allocations. And uh, the frees that are already used, they are u uh, their purpose is to calculate what's called in-use. So in-use is how much stuff did you allocate, but not free yet, which is maybe indicating memory leaks. And th this is what's actually reported in the profile, even though internally the runtime doesn't track in-use, it tracks allocs minus frees. Um, so the profile that you end up with is looking like this. You've got a stack trace. Then for every stack trace, you have the number of objects that have been allocated on this stack trace and the total cumulative amount of bytes those allocations have taken. This is lifetime of the process, so this just keeps going up and up and up. And then you've got in-use objects and in-use space, which basically tells you how many of those allocations have not been freed yet using this calculation here. Um, so again, very cool for tracking memory leak issues. Um, more research on this profiler is needed and will be coming soon. Now the plot profiler, that works kind of similar. Um, if you have uh, operations that can plot like a channel send, so the code pass oops, in the go runtime first checks if it's a non-plocking send. So it checks if the channel is ready. If yes, it can send right away. If not, we take the current time. And then we wait for the channel to be ready. And while we wait, the Go scheduler can run another Go routine on this operating system thread. Uh, once this channel is ready for the send, we calculate the duration, the time duration it took while we were blocked on sending on this channel. Then we do the actual send. And uh, then we decide if we want to randomly sample this blocking channel send operation based on its duration. And if yes, we take a stack trace look it up, increment the number of counts, and the cumulative iteration. Um, this is the plot profile is integrated in channel and mutex code paths in the Go runtime that might park a Go routine while it has to wait for something, like we've seen for the Chen send before. The sampling and recording happens after the blocking event is over and the Go routine is scheduled again. So if you have a Go program that is currently being blocked, you will not see the reason for that in the plot profile until the plot is over. If you want to see what currently is blocking, you can look at the Go routine profile. Some flavors of it have that information. Debug2 is the keyword there. Um, the plot profile also does not track, despite the name, blocking system calls, which you probably won't do in Go, but it's worth knowing. Time.sleep, CGO calls, and spin locks, which you will see in the CPU profile. The resulting p-profile looks like this. You've got stack traces, and you've got the count of blocking operations and the cumulative duration of them. This is only the sampled operations, of course. Um, runtime set block profile rate can be used to control the sampling rate. And my research indicates that 10,000 is a safe default for production. My repository has more details on how I arrived at that conclusion. Um, the sampling, there, I found an issue while researching this profiler, which is that the sampling 
mechanism has a bias that favors long, uh, infrequent long events over frequent short events. And so to fix that, I've submitted a patch upstream, which is currently being reviewed and hopefully will make it into the new Go version. Um, you can find more information on this profile here. And then we have a mutex profiler, which is basically the same as a block profiler, but only doing mutexes. It's built into the unlock code pass, unlike the block profile, which is on the lock code pass. So the sampling and recording happens when unlock unblocks another goroutine that was blocked. Um, you can use runtime set mutex profile fraction to tune the sampling rate, and there is no sampling bias. The pprof output looks exactly the same as for the block profiler. More research will come, which brings us to the final profiler, the thread create profiler. For this one, I can only say that I was not able to get it to work. Um, I found a GitHub issue that's pretty old, that the thread create profile is broken. So I believe that that is the reason why I couldn't get it to work. Um, in theory, it should capture stack traces that cause new operating system threads to be created, and the profile should look like this. This basically concludes this presentation. But to recap, for profiling, stack traces are a load-bearing subsystem, and it's good to understand how they work a little bit to understand the performance overheads and even accuracy. Um, Go uses various techniques uh, for profiling, including tracing, profiling, and hybrid approaches, and it's good to understand them. And to understand how the data is collected is important in order to save profiling and production and to interpret the resulting data correctly. So this is the end. Thank you so much for your attention. The research on Go profiling will be continued. And if you have any questions, uh, now is a good time to ask you. Thanks again. Yay, we are back. Hello, everyone. We have Felix joined us online. So if you have questions, it's time to ask them. Felix, how are you today? Uh, very good. How, how about yourself? Yeah, also good. I see what people uh, thank you for your talk. And yeah, I also want to thank you for joining us today and for giving that presentation. The, the profiling is like a very hot topic, I think. How, how did you like, why, why it's interesting for you personally? How did you jump into it? Um, I started a side project uh, last year in summer. Uh, it was for work. I was working on an ETL pipeline. And I was trying to use Go profiling to figure out where my bottleneck was, but it wasn't clearly just CPU or uh, the database. It was kind of a mix. And I wanted to get a um, comprehensive picture of what was going on. Um, so I wanted like a wall clock profiler, which doesn't currently exist in Go. Um, and then I realized you can actually build one yourself by using the Go routine profile, which I didn't, I mentioned it in the talk uh, on the slide for the Go routine profile. Um, and I put that on GitHub. Uh, as a project called FG Prof, and um, then I uh, I got contacted by by Datadog, the company I work for now. And they were like, "Hey, don't you want to work on profiling?" And I was like, "Sure, but I don't really know anything about that." Um, but they seemed to like be convinced I should be doing that, and it seemed really fun to do. So I joined them in January, and since then I've been going really deep into profiling because I guess it's my day job now. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, profiling is like one of the or like one of the things people quite often mention that they like in Go because it's like quite easy to start dealing with it. Um, from your opinion, how will the future of profiling in Go look like? Um, I don't know what the actual future will look like. If I could ex uh, articulate my dream, I would say it would be nice to have a pipeline for all the profiling data to flow through as sort of a stream of events where subscribers could subscribe to any profiling related events that they want to, and then perhaps make their own sampling decisions and decide what data to potentially fuse together into new interesting data streams. In, in Java, they have something called the Java Flight Recorder that has such an architecture, which is actually very similar to the Go Tracer that's built in. Um, and I would like to see Go moving in this, a direction like this. Um, but uh, yeah, that's kind of far-fetched dream. I don't think anybody's currently working on this, but I'll try to, as part of my job, to, to make contributions upstream and maybe at some point I'll get to do some larger projects as well. Um, I see there's a question. Um, 
how to do continuous profiling in production. Um, the general idea for that and what we're doing at Datadog and what other companies are doing is you run the CPU profiler either 100% of the time um, and then you just stop it like once per minute, let's say, and you upload the last minute's worth of profiling data to a server where you can then view the resulting profiles through some UI or something. Um, you can also run the CPU profiler only part of the time. So you run it, let's say, for 30 seconds, then you turn it off for 30 seconds and so on. Um, you could do that if you're a little bit worried about the overhead, which generally isn't too bad, but um, that's another way to do it. And for the other profiles, uh, you generally just take snapshots. So you, you take like the heap profile once a minute or something and you upload it to a server. Um, and then you can have a UI uh, to, to look at it or some other products. I mean, you can also just download them and use GoTool PProf as a, as a UI. I hope that answers the question. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I guess that was our last question. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you for having me and have a great remaining day in conference. Yeah, hopefully see you next time. That would be lovely.